Uh, um, well, thank you. Thank you, Luis, for inviting me to give a talk. Um, this is some of the work that um, we have uh, done at the University of Iowa uh, with David uh, Hassan, who is you know, one of the pioneers in this field. These are my disclosures. Um, so this is like the outline. I'm going to be quick because there's a lot of speakers waiting. Uh, 15 minutes promised. Um, so, you know, this is com comes back from what we were saying yesterday, you know, and Ricardo brought up this issue. When you have somebody in your office comes with a three millimeter, four millimeter aneurysm, can you tell this person is the aneurysm going to rupture or not? Um, so can we predict the risk of rupture of the aneurysm? So we're going to try to answer some of these questions in this talk. Um, there is a lot of literature showing that contrast enhancement of the aneurysm might be a uh, sign that the aneurysm is close to rupture. So what does it mean? What does contrast enhancement mean? Um, can we measure contrast enhancement? You know, the signal intensity of, of the enhancement of the aneurysm, can it, that be measured? And what's next? So you know, the determination if an aneurysm is going to rupture, the, the answer to this question is not an easy question. It's a complex question. It's not a one-way answer. Um, it has a lot of pieces of the puzzle. So we're going to try to address each of one. We're going to start talking with signal intensity, computational fluid dynamics. Uh, one of the first to uh, works from Charles Matou from Yale, um, he was one of the uh, one first ones to show that if you do an MRI on a person that has multiple aneurysms, you might be able to tell which aneurysm rupture based on the enhancement of the contrast uh, of the aneurysm, the aneurysm wall. Uh, for example, this case series of patients with two or three aneurysms they were able to do uh, aneurysm wall enhancement with high resolution based wall imaging. And at the time of clipping, they were able to confirm that the aneurysm that had more enhancement was the aneurysm that actually ruptured. So, one of the first uh, works from Matuk, this is a, another case of two aneurysms a paraphthalmic aneurysm and a terminal IC aneurysm. And you can see clearly the enhancement of the terminal IC aneurysm that was later treated. And this correlated with the histopathological findings of the of the of the treatment. That nurse that enhanced more had more rupture. This is some of the work that uh, was done by our group at the University of Iowa. Um, again, another aneurysm terminal uh, IC aneurysm. The aneurysm didn't enhance. This is an elective case. We did histological correlation uh, after clipping of the aneurysm. And you can tell the difference of these aneurysm with these other aneurysm that you can see that is more enhancement and you see these atherosclerotic changes in the wall of the aneurysm that correlate with histopathology. Um, so one of the interesting things that we found from this uh, small uh, case here is first we confirm that uh, aneurysm enhancement correlates with inflammation because this is one of the questions. When you see enhancement, what does that mean? And our group with some other groups from Japan and some other parts of the world have confirmed that when you do histological correlation with enhancement, there is definitely evidence of uh, inflammation with presence of macrophages, T cells. Uh, and the other thing that we found, or which was a little bit con uh, contradictory, was that the thickness of the wall also changed. And in this case, there was more enhancement in, in the part of the wall where it was thicker. And that's probably because of the atherosclerotic changes. But some other groups have found that um, the thinner part of the wall ha is the one that enhances because it loses elastase. And that's probably what prompts the rupture. Um, so as I said, uh, there's multiple uh, case series around the world. Mo this is like the hot topic right now in uh, high resolution based wall imaging and prediction of aneurysm rupture. So uh, this is like a small compilation of the review that we published recently. It's about 1,400 uh, patients um, that have ha undergone high-resolution based wall imaging. And uh, you know, we analyze all this data, and the interesting thing that I want to underline is that the adjudication if an aneurysm had increased contrast enhancement was done subjectively. You know, if we're really trying to uh, make this automated and we're trying to use this as a tool to predict aneurysm rupture, it's very unpredictable if you have two different people sitting in the room and say, oh, this aneurysm enhances, this aneurysm doesn't enhance. So it's not really um, a good tool if you're going to have a subjective measurement. And that's why 
No, we um, we analyze aneurysms in in, uh, in in Iowa, and David uh, started this protocol with high resolution three Tesla MRI, and later on I started doing some seven Tesla studies with uh, aneurysm well enhancement. Um, this is one of the um, seven Tesla aneurysms that we image. Uh, we have different views. Uh, on the far right, you have the axial, then the, you have the coronal and the sagittal. And um, I want you guys to notice that you have the T1 pre, T1 post on the on the bottom row. And uh, at first view, you don't see much. You know, you notice any difference between this one and that one in the T1 pre and T1 post? So if you magnify it, and that's why we start using high resolution, you see this uh, particular enhancement of, of the of the aneurysm. And the interesting thing, we start measuring the enhancement, and you see, for example, that the enhancement in this part of the aneurysm, the, the measurement was 349, while in the side was 73, and the posterior wall of the aneurysm is, is uh, much lower, 302. So we start correlating, and we start noticing these differences with the seven Tesla MRI imaging. And, um, you know... Uh, it's, it's mostly in this part, this is, uh, but the, the enhancement is uniform. But th we notice that there are some areas of the wall that enhance more than other areas, but is is around. And some parts don't enhance at all. So that's that's an excellent question because basically what it's telling you is that the wall aneurysm is like a microenvironment. It's, it's, a, it's a process that keeps changing all over the aneurysm. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a uniform process. And this is, this is what you can say, you know, what's the gold standard right now for imaging mannerisms that we have? Is the 3D rotational angiogram. And on the 3D rotational angiogram, a lot of times we see little details like the presence of saccular, by, um, uh, small daughter sacs or blebs. And this case, this particular case of an unruptured echo mannerism, this correlated with this area of increased enhancement on the 7 Tesla MRI that actually is the bleb. So very interesting f uh, uh, finding telling us that there is a microenvironment, there is a, is a changing story within the wall of the aneurysm. Um, you know, yesterday we were talking about the size of aneurysms. A lot of people say, you know, a three millimeter aneurysm, I'm not gonna treat. But you have these outliers of small aneurysms that start changing, you know. This is an interesting case of a patient that came to our clinic. She came because she had a stroke. We did a um, MRI, and the MRI we had a little bleph in the pica. Then she came back, we did a follow-up. Uh, and then she had a CTA, and the blood was changed, the, the, the out, outpouching was changing and turned into an aneurysm. We did seven Tesla MRI imaging, and notice the increased enhancement of the, of, the, of, the, of the wall of the aneurysm, like avid enhancement of the, wall in, uh, and, uh, of the aneurysm. So definitely something is going on with the small aneurysm. Something triggers this inflammatory response in this patient that caused the aneurysm to grow and change, and also this is reflected on the enhancement on the seven Tesla MRI. Probably the the flow due to the shear rate, shear stress is so low. Could it be related to the low flow condition within the lab that might be related to enhancement? Yeah. Because the, the the previous cases you showed a lab, and then normally mentally thinking it the wall needs to be thinner than the rest of the aneurysm. But what you showed is that the wall appeared to be thicker at the baby aneurysm level, which is not quite understandable. Uh, this is new, huh? yeah, uh, we do a lot of wall announcement as well, the, the, but it, it's the, the sequences that we were using is not sufficient to create a black blood all the time, depending upon the very low flow rates within the baby aneurysm. Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question, and you, you went uh, five slides in front of me, but, uh, but um, there is a group now uh, that has correlated computational fluid dynamics with enhancement, and they did find that you have uh, decreased wall shear stress with increased enhancement. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a paradox because you might think that you have uh, increased wall shear stress and then the aneurysm rupture. Well, actually, what we're finding is that in the areas of decreased wall shear stress is where you have more enhancement, and there's also where usually the aneurysms rupture. 
And that's, uh, that's this is a paper coming up uh, from a group from Stanford that's already uh, in general nursery that show that. Um, we also have found that um, with some of uh, our data. But it's different things for the past. It's not only the dynamics and the enhancement and all of that. So the process for, for uh, you know, analyzing this data uh, on seven Tesla imaging is that you have to really do a code registration segmentation. It's, it's a laborious process, and then you have to do uh, ROI sampling and normalization. One of the things also we, we, we were wanted to do with the study was uh, you know, turn the page and do uh, some more objective measurements. So we um, did a lot of analysis, and there's a lot of papers describing different objective ways to measure the analysis. And some of them had the T1 pre T1 post, and then they got a ratio. Some of them normalized the enhancement with the pituitary stalk. Some, uh, some other groups normalized the enhancement with the corpus callosum. So it's all over the place. You know. Uh, 1,400 patients, nobody really knows what they're doing or they know what they're doing, but nobody has really looked everything at, uh, in detail. So this paper was going to publish also in uh, Journal of Neurosurgery. And basically what we did is we look at uh, our database of 102 unruptured intracranial aneurysms, and we did all the measurements, you know, T1 pre, T1 post, uh, normalization with the corpus callosum, normalization with pituitary stock. And the best result or the most reliable was uh, for area under the curve was the pituitary stock. And this was consistent, you know, and we were using this size as the landmark to determine instability. So, you know, definitely seems like the best way to measure enhancement is with pituitary stock. There is um, another uh, paper that is coming up also, uh, data from aspirin, that we did measure the, use the pituitary stock to normalize the enhancement of rapture mechanisms, and it does show that aspirin decreases the enhancement, that that's also coming up. It's not, I'm not gonna present that in this lecture, but it's coming up also in uh, Journal of Neurosurgery. Um, the other key question, to use this tool in different uh, places and to try to use it as a predictor is, are you seeing the same enhancement or are you getting the same ratio in different machines? You know, because you might have at your hospital a Siemens, I might have a GE, somebody else has a Philips. And if you really wanna use this consistently, prospectively, you have to um, have the same tool that work the same and give you the same measurements. So we did have uh, that data. We have so far uh, scanned 10 patients. Um, these patients were scanned 40 hours, uh, 48 hours in between the scanners for a Siemens and a GE, and we got the same ratio. You're not gonna get the same measurement of enhancement because obviously the amount of contrast you're giving is different, but the ratio when you normalize it with pituitary stock is the same. So, you know, uh, go, so this is the gold standard? Probably not because it's just giving us part of the picture. So you have to take into account, you know, what um, we were mentioning different, uh, uh, other things like the fluid dynamics, the wall shear stress, the vortex ratio, and all of that. And we're trying to find what we mentioned before, that in these areas where you have the increased enhancement, where the bleb is, you have areas of decreased wall shear stress. And, um, and you see the dot there is, is blue because there's where the flow jet goes to the upper part of the aneurysm. That's probably where the aneurysm grows, how the aneurysm starts enlarging, but then you have these areas of decreased wall shear stress that have more inflammation, you have more enhancement, that these are areas probably that rupture, that in this, ca this case, the bleph uh, underneath that. Um, so uh, the same with this other case, this is another uh, uh, supraclinal aneurysm, unruptured. We have the T1 pre, T1 post. And uh, again, we're seeing that there are different vectors uh, working in the enlargement aneurysm, but that not necessarily means that these areas of, uh, uh, probably this is how the aneurysm is enlarging, but most of the inflammation is probably happening in the anterior or superior and inferior wall of the aneurysm, and not necessarily here. And uh, you know, you might wonder if uh, this is gonna change over time, and that's gonna make the aneurysm more prone to rupture. One of the things we're trying to optimize is get 3D maps of the uh, uh, signal intensity, because now some of the assessment is limited because we only have 2D views in different views. But ideally, we'd like to have a 3D map so we can look at the enhancement, same as the computational fluid dynamics. Um, you know, some of the critiques about the enhancement are, you know, is this some art artifact from, you know, positioning of the patient, is done some artifact from flow. So we analyze and we use the high signal intensity of the seven Tesla imaging to look at the parent vessel. 
you know, what's happening with the parent vessel? Because if we think that it's an inflammatory process, the inflammatory process probably happens at the neck and, there is on, and that probably starts in the parent vessel. So we, so we analyze, we sample the parent vessel close to the neck, um, and we did different measurements, uh, 0.5 um, centimeter, one centimeter next to the neck of the aneurysm, and we compared this parent vessel, the signal intensity of the sac, we got a ratio and we compared it with a reference vessel that was in a different vascular territory. For example, if an aneurysm was in the, in the um, uh, anterior circulation, the reference vessel was in the posterior in the basilar or PCA. And we did, we did find that there is a correlation of enhancement um, of the parent vessel. So the inflammatory process or whatever is happening in the aneurysm it's, it's also happens in the parent vessel in close proximity to the neck, and also the enhancement decreases as we go away from the neck. And um, so it's probably not just, uh, I, I don't think, you know, all these signals we're getting are telling us this is not an artifact, this is probably something that's telling us there is an inflammatory process that's happening. And it's also not flow related because if the parent vessel is also affected, it's showing some changes of increased enhancement, it's probably not because of flow, because, you know, the flow in the parent vessel for the most part is laminar, and when it gets into the aneurysm, it turns into these turbulent vortexes that cause the aneurysm to grow and sometimes rupture. Um, some more of the data about the parent vessel that we found um, that uh, changes. The other part of the puzzle, and uh, this is also very important, uh, also this was pioneered by uh, David, is the presence of iron in the aneurysm wall, you know. And uh, one of the first uh, proof of principle was the study of the formoxitol that showed that you have these nanoparticles of iron that accumulate in the vessel wall. Um, several patients were scanned. Uh, 72 hours post infusion, you have this halo of iron. So w the other thing we're looking is if we can predict if there is accumulation of iron within the aneurysm wall, because that's probably telling us that this unstable aneurysm is having micro hemorrhages. Um, we're using some of the protocol that was developed in Cornell and also uh, collaborating with the University of Chicago. And they have this protocol called QSM, which is uh, quantitative susceptibility mapping, which usually looking at iron, the presence of iron, the positive iron. Some other groups are using the same protocol to look at amyloid angiopathy in patients with dementia or some other applications for the same protocol. Uh, the protocol is done with a three Tesla MRI. These are the acquisitions. And um, we, we found this very useful and also tried to prove the use of the, of the protocol in sentinel headaches. This is, for, is a 75-year-old female presented with a typical sentinel headache, you know, uh, CT negative, LP negative, worst headache of her life. They didn't find anything besides an aneurysm. And during the QSN, we did find that indeed what she had was a small micro hemorrhage. Um, we had a collaborator, Daicho Nakagawa from Japan, who at that time was measuring uh, the volume of these micro hemorrhages. Um, and this was, uh, this was published in the uh, Journal of Neurosurgery and also we published a review on JNS. So, you know, we have, as part of the prediction model, we have already uh, signal intensity of contrast enhancement aneurysm. Now we also had to add the QSM protocol to see if we can quantify and measure the presence of iron in the aneurysm wall. The morphology is another thing that we have to keep into account. Everybody knows that the aneurysm has uh, the other sag or has a black is more unstable, so we don't have to take that off the equation. We have to use that as well. And also the clinical data, like Ricardo was saying yesterday, and it's very important you have a family history, but you know, this phase score is uh, what we have, and some other groups use other scores, but as we said before, you know, it doesn't mean that you are from some area of the world that has not been studied, your risk of rupture is going to decrease just because there is no data about it. So it's not really a good tool. It's not, it's, not, it's not giving us the whole picture, but probably it needs to be taken into account when you develop this, um, this score or this protocol to, to determine when someone is close to rupture. Um, so, you know, the limitations and, and the challenges, you know, Fusiform aneurysms. The fusiform aneurysms are a different beast because they are more difficult to predict. You know, they have a lot of atherosclerotic changes. For example, this vascular tip aneurysm, or fusiform uh, terminal vascular aneurysm. And uh, we have found that this is some, or some of the critiques from, uh, and that's why some people are saying that vessel, vessel wall imaging is because an artifact, because sometimes we see these artifacts. This is a, uh, this aneurysm was imaged with a 7T, and you have these flow-related artifacts. 
So this is just artifact from the flow. There is contrast stagnation within the aneurysm. So we're still dealing with the um, technical processing of this part of the analysis, try to minimize this, and obviously this has to be validated clinically. But we do encounter some artifacts. The same for this other aneurysm um, that has a microhemorrhage. So you know you see it definitely increased enhancement here, but uh, what you see also enhancing is the microhematoma within the aneurysm wall. Um, but definitely there is a lot of changes here, a lot of inflammation, and also some of the flow artifacts that you see in, like in the previous aneurysm. To, so to finalize the talk, you know, um, can we predict the risk of rupture? Um, no, but I think we're getting closer. We have to use all these tools and try to come up with a score to tell a person your risk of rupture based on vessel intensity based on uh, QSM, based on your age, based on your family history is gonna be this. Obviously this has to be clinically validated. Um, contrast enhancement, what does it mean? Um, we are very, very sure, uh, uh, hopefully we're not wrong, that this probably means inflammation is not just an artifact. Uh, can we measure it? Yes, definitely we can measure it. Um, and also what's next? continue to you know, improve the, the technique, validate more the data that we have, and then hopefully at some point do a prospective multicenter study. Uh, the other challenges that we have, you know, it's, uh, MRI, a lot of people cannot go on MRI, is, uh, is very prone to artifact, especially if you are moving. So especially with the seven Tesla, it's very difficult if you have a coronary stent or anything like that, or you just move a little bit, there creates a lot of artifacts. So, I think we have a screen like 100 patients. We have been able to get only 25 uh, scans so far of uh, aneurysms because there are so many contraindications for the, is, these are patients that already had three Tesla MRIs, so the seven Tesla's all, but obviously for clinical uh, um, use is gonna be the three Tesla. Um, other challenges, multifactorial, fusiform of these aneurysms are different based, and also the human factor. Now you can tell a patient, yeah, your risk of rupture is gonna be this much, but what about the psychological factor? Oh, I want this aneurysm to be, still be treated. Um, these are our um, you know, collaborators. Uh, uh, Juan Sebral from Mason University does an amazing job with, uh, with the CFDs and fluid dynamics. Uh, we have a really good group in Iowa. Um, Jorge Roa uh, has done a lot, also a lot of work with us. He's our research fellow, and we got some funding from uh, these institutions. And we're gonna have a meeting in the Galapagos. Uh, we're gonna just be talking about vessel wall imaging, computational fluid dynamics, only aneurysms and risk of rush and things like that, animal models and all of that. Everybody's invited, it's gonna be in March 18th to the 20th, uh, uh, you know. It's gonna be half meeting, half tour, so hopefully you guys can make it, uh, and thank you. <laughs> Questions? Thank you, this is very uh, uh, challenging stuff, and I have a question um, because uh, a group from Amsterdam and analysis did, did also studies, and of course, I'm sure you know that, so I, I would like to hear your comments, and it was presented in Naples, and David was in the room as well, of course, so so I would like to ask your opinion on it. So they did a phantom study eh, with different MR sequences, and there were wonderful images that you saw in the phantom, you saw clear uh, wall uh, uh, enhancement. And but a little bit less or more depending on the sequences, and they, they played with that. So so, how? What's your comment on that study? Yeah, we um, we uh, we're not very happy with <laughs> hearing that data. But you know, there's a lot of things about um, those experiments. First, you know, they they use a tube which is silicon. It's not really going to reproduce the endothelium and the inflammation. We're trying to find a good parallel. Uh, to use like animal model, something that will reproduce the conditions of our brain aneurysm and see there is different conditions of enhancement that will be changed by flow. Uh, so the model I don't think is perfect. The other thing that goes against being just an artifact is that we did find changes in the parent vessel of brain aneurysm. You know, there's definitely differences in enhancement. So that would, explain, would not be explained just because of flow. Um, so I, I think the flow is part of the equation uh, probably what's happening is you have changes of flow that prompt the, the inflammatory process, um, and then uh, and then you have the 
pathogenesis of the aneurysm sometimes progresses to rupture. Um, but I think the enhancement uh, might be a little bit altered or modified by flow, but also I think it's showing inflammation based on the data of the parent vessel and, and, the, and the model. And uh, the Helsinki guy says, so uh, Batum told me yesterday, so he, had, he has a patent of a new uh, uh, substance that uh, he wants to investigate. Would, would be interesting to work, uh, to cooperate with the Helsinki group because so, of course he didn't want to tell what kind of uh, stuff it was, but uh, it was also to, to uh, have a better wave enhancement for, uh, so and to also to define aneurysms at risk for rupture or, or not. The, the uh, Madgun is also published a study that yes, they had a chelate that with iron that uh, know, targeted, yeah. uh, but is no, it's not being used in humans. Is no. is only seven Tesla data, but you know I think that where we're heading, you know, have some type of chelate or something that will go and uh, locate these areas of instability in aneurysm, and then we can see it and say, yeah, this aneurysm is close to rupture, like the case uh, Ricardo presented yesterday, the PCOM, you know, I agree, I wouldn't treat that patient, and then you simply, we don't know, there's so many ACOM aneurysms that are two or three millimeters, and they still rupture, you know. Perhaps you do remember the good old days, we used to use a coil called matrix, and then after the matrix embolization, I happened to do a couple of MR examination, and I saw an incredible amount of wall inflammation, but the, the, the difference between the inflammation that we used to see with matrix than what we see with the so-called wall enhancement that you describe is that the outer face of the uh, enhancement was blurred because the enhancement was extending toward the uh, epiluminal or abluminal space as well. We did some uh, vessel wall examination in order to differentiate between the vasculitis and the atherosclerosis because it will change the whole story of the treatment. And then we happen to see that one of the pitfalls that we see, if there is a important narrowing, after the narrowing, there is a so-called, uh, well, it says something like imitation of wall enhancement because there is no flow. You said that the enhancement is seen where you see the low shear stress. Low shear stress means that the longitudinal forces acting on the wall, which is flow, is no longer present there. Therefore, it means that the no flow condition on the wall is thicker than the expected, where you may see the enhancement not because of the wall itself, but also because of the existing very slow flow within that region. That's why I'm trying always to ask, are we sure that this is the enhancement or is it because the, there is an extreme slow flow in certain part of the aneurysm due to the low shear stress, due to the low longitudinal flow on the wall that appears to be some kind of wall enhancement? Yeah, I mean, the, the, one of the issues with the wall shear stress is that, you know, the, the computational flow dynamic studies, they have to assume a lot of things. You know, it's very difficult. They have to assume the velocities, uh, proximal ICA, MCA, and all of that. So uh, they are not the gold standard either to measure uh, stress within the wall. You know, it's, it's a lot of prediction models and computational models. So I wouldn't, I mean, I, I think it's part of the equation. And that's why I don't say, you know, we have to just go by CFDs or uh, enhancement. I think we have to take that data and um, try to put everything together with the QSM and the enhancement and the CFDs and then determine, yeah, this is, this is an aneurysm that's unstable. But, you know, there's still uh, some questions like, uh, you know, the low flow, but the parent vessel shouldn't have low flow. And we do see some enhancement closer to the neck, increased enhancement. Uh, so that's probably telling us that, you know, there's some inflammatory process that's affecting the parent vessel that ultimately leads to the formation of the aneurysm. And that's why I think it's useful, you know, to do imaging with a high resolution at like seven Tesla because you really can uh, get rid of the noise and really do uh, uh, ROIs of like these parent vessels that you know that are less than a millimeter. So, uh, you know, I think we have to keep getting more data and trying to see if there's more artifact control.